And our next segment will be chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. And it's all about what faith looks like when we're not just sitting around. This, this is one of the most powerful sections in all of Scripture to show the beautiful relationship, the, the cooperative nature between faith and works. Because often, again, we live in a, in a culture, in a society that almost breeds false dichotomies and, and creates extreme positions and then says, now you have to pick your side. You're either in camp faith and grace or you're in camp works. And they create it as if one is bad and the other is good and there's no, no cooperative work going on between the two of them. It's like cutting Jesus in half and saying, which side do you want? And which side will you abandon? I want all of them. It would be like saying, okay, which side of the scissors is the most important? Which blade? <laughs> and the reality is, is we're not going to be able to do anything if we isolate one of these attributes of the gospel at the expense of the other. They have to come together. So look at verse 14. What does a prophet, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? It'd be like saying, I'll, I'll pray for you, but I have the means to help you, but I'm not going to help you. I'll, I'm going to pray for you. I have faith that things are going to work out for you. Or perhaps more mundane, uh, I go to a church activity and I bring sugary treats and then I pray that they will bless my body. Now, that does take a lot of faith. <laughs> Indeed. Now, here's the, the, the two-verse um, proverbial statement to sum this idea up. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now, pause, time out, take a step back from this, and now put this in the context of the, the bigger first century Christian world. Keep in mind, Paul was traditionally writing to uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, all in different bodies of the church, different uh, branches or wards of the church, in different locations in the Greco-Roman or pagan world. And so a lot of the themes he's picking up and sharing with them are to push against some of the Judaizer influences in some of those areas because they're, they're trying to get those Gentile Christians to become more Jewish. And the pagan world had a lot of works about all sorts of sacrificial systems you had to do to call down the powers of whatever God you're worshiping. And you can think about Paul. He's like, hey, let's just get first fundamentally correct that you have to be good with Jesus. You're walking through a whole bunch of ritual actions on its own won't save you. In that regard, Paul was quite inspired to encourage people to focus on faith in Jesus Christ instead of, I got to run down to the local temple and make sure I sacrifice the right thing to Jupiter so I can have a good deal in my business dealings. And so now, in contrast to that, you get James writing his letter to Jew uh, Jewish Christians who maybe are getting caught up in. This idea of, oh, wait, maybe I can completely abandon all works because the idea of none of my works are going to save me is taking root. And he's saying, be careful. And now you can see how it's not a false dichotomy because Paul isn't pushing against the works that Jesus has asked them to do in the Gospels or what we would call the law of the Gospels. Paul is not pushing back against that. In fact, He's, he's promoting it over and over again. And now James here is reminding these Jewish Christians, be careful that you don't sit back now and say, oh, well, I guess I don't need to do anything. He's saying, if a man say, thou hast, hast faith and I have works, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. And then he gives one of the most incredible uh, 
statements on this topic that I know of. Verse 19, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. This is one of those, those moments of, of power and clarity where he's making it so crystal clear that if you believe in God, even if you know that God is there, well, guess what? Even the devils believe that. Even the devils know that. And they tremble at that. The difference is the devils believe that they don't do anything about it. And th this to me is a powerful reminder that if I want to become more like the Savior Jesus Christ, then I need to follow his teachings, not the philosophies or the interpretations of the world. So now you look at examples from the life of the Savior and the, and the teachings of the Savior where he says things like, if ye love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if ye love me, just believe in me. Or if ye love me, just gain a testimony of me and that's it. Stop there. To know about God or to have a testimony of God is absolutely necessary, but it's not sufficient. The devils even have that knowledge. But it's not rooted in real faith. Because if it were, that assurance level of faith that Elder Bednar has talked about would then lead to the action level of faith. We then do the things that the Savior has asked us to do. And then he gives an example of Abraham sacrificing Isaac. And it was that faith that was manifest in the works that helped him to become known as a friend of God. That, on verse 23. That's a really powerful phrase. A friend of God is actually a covenantal phrase, meaning that God has embraced you at the level of not a subordinate, but as an equal. It's really quite significant. And God wants all that for us. That's why as children of Abraham, we all have the, all have the same opportunity, same gift, same blessing, that we can become friends of God. And this word, Abraham believed God, you could also say Abraham trusted God. You might remember during the Old Testament year, we really spoke a lot about this, that God was, among other things, attempting through the ancient scriptures to demonstrate he is a trustworthy God. You can trust him. So if you can trust that God is who he says he is, you can act in faith and know that things will turn out. So that is how faith informs action. Now, again, we all found a war in heaven so we can get down here and act. We are now here to show that we trust God through our actions. Now, isn't that amazing that you have you have these two things, these two principles, or can we even call them uh, aspects of deity, aspects of God? You have the laws of God, and you have the love of God. And the world that we live in today is increasingly beating the drum of pick your side. Either you take God's love or you take God's laws, but not both. As if you have to pick, this is a, what you'd call a fool's choice. It's a false dichotomy because God's love is not separate and distinct or individual, uh, individually isolated from his laws. The fact that God loves us means that he gives us laws, because without that, all we're left with is the person staring at us in the mirror trying to decide how to live our life, and that's not going to go very well. So we get God's laws as a sign of his love and realize, oh, it actually fits together. They're not separate. El President Dallin H. Oaks has talked extensively about the love of God and the laws of God being together, not isolated. So this idea of faith and works, same thing. 